I'd like to uh, say hello. We're here with Steve Hunter, and I'd like to start with kind of uh, an artist's early um, relationship with music. And I, I, from reading other interviews and, and reading about you through the years, I know you um, you started out actually on harmonium and lap steel and, and other instruments. What was your first instrument? Tell us a little about your beginning of music as a kid. Well, I never played harmonium. <laughs> no? Okay. No, uh, although I do like them. Yeah. Uh, what, where did that I, story? Yeah. I've never played them, but I did start out on lap steel. Lap steel, eight. right. Yeah. Okay. That was, that was my first guitar. And then right around 12, I went to regular guitar. Okay. That. Yeah. Around 12. Okay. So I, I must have read a bad story that, 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 that your family had a harmonium or your, one of your relatives. No, I, I, think I, I think I know what you're talking about. Uh, my grandparents had um, what at the time I thought was an organ. It was called a, we called it a pump organ. Because if you, my dad would sit on the bench and pump it, and then I would play some of the kindergarten songs, I would work them out. But I found out later that it was actually a harmonium. Okay. But see, I didn't know that at the time. I thought it was just an organ. I thought it was a pump organ because it had stops and everything, you know. Okay. But we found out later that it technically was called a harmonium. So that's probably where that came from. Sure, and, and somewhere in a story that got mentioned. Okay, I see. Oh, no, you didn't, I don't think you got mixed up. I just, when I think of harmonium, I think of the ones that you use your hand, you know? Right. Them. It's an Indian instrument. Exactly. Indian. Yeah, that's, but, but, but yeah. lap steel, very early on lap steel, though. That, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, interesting. Yeah. And, um, you know, that, that shows up, I guess that shows up on some of your solo records. And uh, I know there's a, a Tracy Chapman record, right, where you do some lap steel. Yeah, you know, it's really funny. I actually, uh, you got to remember, I started when I was eight, so I really didn't yeah. know for sure. My dad just said, do you want to play an instrument? And I said, yes. And he said, well, what do you want to play? Now, this is a true story. I said, drums. And he said, no, it's got to be music. And <laughs> dr drummers love that story. <laughs> but what he, what he meant was it's got to be notes, you know, and musical notes and stuff. So... Um, I said, okay, well, plus I, I don't think he wanted me bashing on drums all day. So um, uh, the next thing I said was guitar. And my dad had played lap steel guitar for a while. He, when he was in the military, he played a little bit of guitar and stuff. So I ended up starting out on lap steel. Actually, in Jordan, I, I took lessons on it for about four and a half years. And um, I thought when I converted to what's called regular guitar, that I probably wouldn't touch a lap steel again, but I ended up playing it on all kinds of things sure. for the whole rest of my damn career, as, as long as on my own stuff. Exactly, so was, yeah. I was really glad I studied it when I was a kid. That's great. No, because, yes, it, it was just another flavor that you had. And, of course, j just sticking with kind of the formative years for a minute, uh, I've read that, you know, uh, like a lot of people in your generation, Chet Atkins, Dwayne Eddy, you yeah. know, Chuck, Chuck Berry, The Ventures, Noki Edwards, that whole, that, that's what kind of really lit a fire for you, huh? That kind of guitar. Yeah, you know, it, real did, it really did. And the, but the funny thing is when, when you play lap steel, um, of course, you have a steel bar in this hand and then you have your fingers do this sort of finger picking stuff with your right hand. And the really bizarre thing was the stuff I learned on my right hand in last year, I was able to just put that over to regular guitar, which was very similar to what Chet Atkins did. Right. So it was like, it was like it, everything I learned on last steel, I found a place for. Later on when I started learning how to play slide, that all came from lap steel. I mean, lap steel was a really important instrument. That, that's fantastic. That, that's, yeah. um, um, is that um, I didn't see credits or in, in um, what's the word uh, 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 liner notes on your new record? But is there a uh, lovely record, by the way? Uh, well, what instrumentation do you have on there? I know, of course, you're on a bunch of guitars and Tony Levin and Karen yeah. singing. What, what else is on there? Well, first of all, thank you um, for saying that. Yeah. Now, uh, here's the idea the idea was I didn't really want to put 
very many other instruments on it. I wanted to keep it stripped down. I was kind of going for uh, a, a, a new sound, a cleaner, more open sound. So the only thing on all six of those songs, besides Tony and drums, is guitar. Right. So um, I just wanted to use the sound of guitar. I, I'm doing that more and more and, and using keyboards less and less. Okay. And if, if I do decide I want a keyboard sound, quote unquote sound, then I, I have a guitar synth, um, the Roland guitar synth, and I'll plug that into my computer and I have some software synths and I'll use that. But on these six tracks, I kept it just bare, bass, drums, and guitars, and vocal. That's it. Okay, that's well. That's great, and I'm a little blown away there because I'm I'm a big fan of guitar synth. I use them a lot, and I, I've worked for a lot of people with synths. But it's funny when I read all the, the album credits since I was a kid. Um, have you used those on, on, on many records? I mean, uh, you know, even like Swept Away and things like that. Or, what what records do you use guitar synth on? Well, on Swept Away, the guitar synth really hadn't been developed yet, not, or at least not to a usable stage. There was one version out that used an Oberheim uh, module. Right. But it, it didn't track very well. It was really slow. I, I tried one of them out and I really didn't like it. But the odd thing is, I never got to use it on any record. Right. Um, and which is a drag because I really didn't like it. Um, I have used it on a couple of my things, but right off hand, I can't remember what. Yeah. I, the... I, I, used it, I used it as part of. Like, for instance, if I want to put a piano part on something, uh, I'm not that good playing keyboard, so I'd rather work out the piano part on guitar. It's easier for me to play. Right. That's, yeah. No, this is, I, I'm, I'm literally stunned because as someone who's uh, heard your music since I was about 13 or 14, you know, you read these albums and it always says Steve Hunter guitar, you know, it says, um, so that's, that's really great to hear that you're into that technology. Um, which role oh, in yeah, I absolutely love them. I think it's cool. I kept waiting on them. Come on, come out with something. <laughs> you know, right. I wanted to play. I wanted to play guitar with those sounds. Sure, know, really sure, did. sure. What the um, new guitar? Pretty good. The GR fifty five. Uh, okay. I was just, yeah. Is just that what ask, you? It is. I was just going to ask. Sorry, I cut you off there. I was just going to ask which one you had, and yeah. I love. I love the GR fifty five, and I love it. And I've played a bunch of the other ones, GR1 and GR50. The, the, uh, uh, what I love about this, though, is uh, um, it's got the other just regular guitar amps in there. So you can get a Fender Twin, you can get a Boogie, you can get all that stuff. But then that rich amount of synthesis, and you can program it. So yeah. I, I love the 55, and it tracks great. It tracks really well. Yeah, I'm amazed wow. to have it. Yeah. yeah. And I do... Uh, I, I plug it into the computer via USB. Okay. And then I can control really, really big, sophisticated software synths like Omnisphere and uh, some of those. Uh, Omnisphere is one of the most gorgeous software synths out there. It's really beautiful. Huge, 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 big library of sounds. And then there's some keyboard, other keyboard synths that I have. I like to use that to play those things. So, um, yeah. That GR55 is terrific. Yeah, that no, th this is again, Steve. This is so funny how unpredictable. Didn't think we'd be talking about synths, and I know Omnisphere very well. Yeah. I've met uh, Eric Pershing a couple of times, the guy who developed it. He used to be at Roland. I love that guy. I hope I get to meet him one day. He's the guy that developed Omnisphere. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, I, I worked for many years for Eddie Jobson, you know, from UK yeah, and all no, that. Yeah. So he yeah. he's a big Omnisphere guy. So that's where I used it. But yeah, just, just uh, I, well, I hope you, you do uh, some more with guitar synth because uh, people love your playing and, and, and that's a very popular thing these days, the, the kind of extra technology of guitar. So I hope you, you know, get to do that. But this record, uh, focusing back again on um, th this Café La Rouge record, uh, yeah. Covered With Love, um, and w what a clever title because it's all covers and, and people should know this. <laughs> well, Karen thought of that. Oh, great. You picked that some more. Karen. And um, I, I had a few more rude names for it. That we, <laughs> yeah, that we really can't use. <laughs> that, that's great. Well, uh, no, uh, some some of my favorite things on there. You know, um, I love, of course, Centerpiece. I'm a big Joni Mitchell fan, but just some great classics. You know, it's wonderful. The Gershwin tune on there and Spooky. So really cool to hear you just chill and do some old favorites. 
and the yeah. recording is fantastic. Uh, where Thank did you, you do it? I, I have my own studio. I have a, a Pro Tools studio, you know, and okay. um, it's taken me, man, like so many years to collect good good plugins and to get the right gear. It's just taken me forever. It's not like I, cause I, it, it's one of the re one of the reasons is I haven't had like two million dollars to go throw out a bunch of gear, which you know probably would have saved me a lot of time. Right. But so I've had to do it in little stages along the way, and I've finally gotten to the place where I've got some wonderful sounding plugins, and I've learned how to use them. It's taken me some time, you know, um, and uh, I've got some great gear that gets the recording, gets the stuff into the into the uh, sorry into the computer and back out again sounding really good. So it's finally, it's taken me forever, but it's finally, I'm very happy with what the gear I have. That, that's great. And th this is wonderful also to learn a whole other side of you, uh, your engineering and producing, because obviously we know you've had an ear to that kind of thing. But so this is great. Well, let's stay on that road for a minute, because of course, one of the, one of the amazing uh, aspects of your, I think, amazing career um, is, is uh, working with, uh, the teams you've been on and working with Bob Ezrin for so long that yeah. what you just said it really uh, keys in because you've been around the, some of the greatest sounding records in, hit, yeah. in, in rock history and the Berlin record the Lou Reed record and um, you know of course many Lou Reed records you're on but but was that the first time you, you played with, uh, with with work with Ezrin and work with Tony Levin for instance is that that team uh well, the uh, the first time I worked with Bob Ezrin actually was when uh, he did the Mitch Ryder album I was on, which was called Detroit. Right. He, he was he was the producer, and that's where he and I met. Ah. Oh. And then it's a weird, obtuse sort of thing. I had done this arrangement of Lou Reed's Rock and Roll for Mitch Ryder in Detroit, and we ended up doing it and putting it on the album. And the weird, bizarre thing was. Lou Reed heard it on the radio and absolutely loved it and tracked Bob and me down for because he wanted us to play on his next record. Wow. And it was like one of those really weird, bizarre things, you know, where there was a big circle. And, uh, Lou Reed Berlin was my second album. It's the second album I ever recorded. Right. Yes. So, and, and but I, okay, yes, the the, the um, of course the Mitch Ryder Detroit connection, that that yeah. that makes total sense. Wow, so that's um, the funny part. There is uh, you know, and not to inject my life into this, but I work for Steve Howe, who played on the first Lou Reed album. So yeah, that's right. So, <laughs> so you have Steve H, because um, I remember years ago a magazine did a great article. I was so happy that they included you, but they did an article on the Steve H's. And it was Hillage, Hackett, <laughs> Hunter, and Howe. <laughs> There's so, a bunch of them, yeah. No. Yeah, but I love that, um, you know, that, that people know that. Well, that, you know, the funny thing about that is that while doing the Berlin album, we were at Morgan Studios in London. And right across, you know, there's there's a little road, and right across the road is another Morgan studio, the second, the second set of studios. And over there was Yes. Wow. So I'm in the studio with Bob, and uh, we were thinking we were talking about the next tune. I think it was Men of Good Fortune or something. And he said, "You know, you have a Univibe." And I said, "No, I, I did have it. it. It was broken. It didn't work. So I didn't bring it with me to London." And he said, "Well, let's go see if Steve has it." <laughs> so we went over to Morgan and met Steve Howe. He was there, and we asked him, "Steve, do you have a Univibe? Can we just borrow it for a couple of days?" He said, "Oh yeah, sure." So he gives me his Univibe. I take it over. I use it on Men of Good Fortune. It was wonderful. I love those things. Um, so then when we took it back, we said, well, Steve, we're doing this other tune where we kind of want to have a, a special kind of sound. We're thinking about maybe a choral sitar. Do you have one? Oh, sure I do. Here. And he grabs it. And I ended up using his choral sitar on one of the tunes. And it, 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 he's a really nice guy. I did Great. many years later, I ended up touring with him on the night of the guitars. Oh, yeah. So like we had this weird connection. <laughs> That's, and, and a terrific guy, one of the sweetest guys ever. He's, and, um, 
you know, I've worked for so many people and it, it's one of the, the top experiences for me. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell yeah. him you said hello. I just spoke with him a couple of days ago. Oh, please tell him, would you? I love yeah. that guy. Yeah. He's a great Chet guy, great Chet Atkins guy. Well, that's the thing. I, I thought that was a nice uh, thing. You're around the same generation. Yeah, you're about yeah. a year apart. And so, of course, growing up on, on Chuck and Chet and, you know, <laughs> rock and roll. So uh, yeah. he's got a wonderful new record out, too, called Love Is. So hopefully you can Oh, good. That. I'll have to look it up. Yeah, really good. Wow, what, what a great record, too. And I think uh, as many of the reviews... I think people just didn't get it. It was too. They didn't get it. No, yeah. I love that you came back years later and, and, and were able to perform it with Lou. Yeah. Beautiful. That, uh, that was a dream for Bob and I. You yeah. Know, that we see I, that album became my album. I mean, I worked, we, I worked with Bob so much on that album that it just really became my album. I, I fell in love with it. Every, Every song was just brilliant, and I loved the lyrics and the story and everything. So I was really, I think I was as hurt as, as much as Lou was when we got all this, when I got panned and everything. It really hurt my feelings, because I thought it was a wonderful album. I was really proud of it. So when we got to do it live, Bob called me up and said, guess what, we're going to do a movie live, uh, Berlin live. And um, we're going to do it from start to finish, just like the record, and I thought, Oh man, we've been waiting to do that for forty years. Yeah, that was a treat. It's 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 stunning, and it it, it was pulled off so wonderfully, and so many great uh, other players fleshing it out. And, and yeah. you know, um, well, you know, music's timeless, and and let's hope that some of the younger people or, or any age watching this can go rediscover Berlin because it, it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we got skipped a little bit. Was that your first time working with Tony Levin? Uh, let me think. Yeah, it was. Um, I actually I didn't meet him on the Berlin album. He had um, Bob had used him on I think the kids, and I didn't play yeah. acoustic guitar on that. Somebody else did. Okay. I, I ended up playing slide on it, but that was later. So I never met him on the Berlin album. I was where I met him on the uh, Welcome to My Nightmare album. Okay. Album. Sure, sure. And that's we're gonna... the first time I met him. Yeah. That's um, well, yeah. The um, of course, yeah. Your your partnership there with, with Wagner. We're going to talk about that a little bit. But but the yeah. um, the, uh, the 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 Alice Cooper years. Uh, well, we well, let's jump right to that because I wanted to talk about this long friendship with Tony because you know there was this this team there with with you and Schwartzberg and of course Wagner. Yeah. And yeah. Lace and Whiskey goes to hell, uh, and then and then over in the Gabriel years. So so tell us a little bit about. Uh, how things segued and again same team bob ezrin coming over to the alice cooper tell us a little bit about that what the first time working with cooper with some of those folks well the cool thing about alice is that when i was with mitch Ryder, um, the alice cooper group was in detroit at that time and uh they were they were kind of just on the verge of recording the first album and um, I, there were some things going on in the background with Jack Richardson and Bob Ezra and stuff. I didn't know anything about that. Really. I just know I saw him a couple of times uh, play live in Detroit. And um, I met them all. And we, we ended up like being pretty fast friends. You know, I, I thought they were all great guys, all of them. And I'm still friends with Dennis Dunaway. And of sure. Course, and uh, I've done stuff with the whole, with the whole band. Well, I did the... Uh, Hall of Fame with him. And stuff. Right, and, and but, Paranormal, uh, and yeah. Yeah, 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 Paranormal. I've yeah. done some stuff. Uh, so we're still good friends. But I, I met, uh, I had already kind of got to know them before Welcome to the Nightmare. And then I, I heard that there was some ruckus going on. I didn't know what, I didn't know what was happening. And next thing you know, Alice is doing a solo album. And I had thought at the time, oh, all well, the guys are going to do solo albums. That's kind of what I had thought was going on. And um, later on, I think that's when I heard, well, okay, well, maybe it's like a breakup thing. But I tend to not get too involved in that, you know? It's really kind of none of my business. And I just, and so I kind of stay out of that. I, I don't sure. really want to talk about the politics and stuff. Sure. So then I find out where uh, Alice is going to do a, a, a solo album. And Bob, uh, Ezra, by this time, had sort of put me and Dick Wagner together. And then we sort of put together a band for the Lou Reed Live and the Rock and Roll Animal album and the tour and stuff. And mostly that band, the biggest hunk of that band, became the Welcome to the Nightmare band. 
because we'd already played together and we worked well so well together that I think Bob just thought, well, this will be a head start in the studio to to doing these songs if we got a band that's already been playing together, you know. Uh, which I think was he was right about that. I think it made it a lot easier. Absolutely. No, it's uh and, and what it, again, that core team and and then going in and out if, if it's not Tony, it's Prakash. And uh, yeah. if it's not Swartzburg, it's uh, Pentiglan. And That's um, right. uh, how, how do you pronounce his name correctly from, from a close friend of his? I, I never. No, that's exactly right. Pentiglan. Penti, oh, okay. Pentiglan. Okay. He's, uh, his, he was from Finland. Yeah. So it's a Finnish name. Uh, wow. We call him Whitey. Right, right. But Penti Whitey yeah. Glan, yeah. Yeah. Which, which probably in, in politically correct 21st century. <laughs> Someone's gonna tag the video, but uh, but that was his name, that, was, yeah. right? What can we yeah, say? Yeah, something different to different people. Yeah, different. It, it, that was his name. That was his name. But I've been called Whitey before, and I never quite understood why. But now I, you know. <laughs> the, yeah, but uh, so yeah, rest in peace. But yeah, his playing on Rock and Animal, and you know uh, what? What? Yeah. Well, yeah. well, this is uh, I. I already consider you one of the just just this connective tissue, Steve, between. So much important rock and roll. I mean, when some of the riffs that 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 are out there, whether it's uh, Salisbury Hill or the opening of of Rock and Roll Animal or the stuff on Ghost to Hell, you know, these are these are records that influenced all the hard rock groups that came later, all the the Guns and Roses and everything. Um, yeah. And and so to hear what you're saying that the Cooper Band used to come see you play. And the Mitch Ryder yeah, band. Hey, wow. You know that was th that's true, and it's really kind of funny because that all that stuff was back in the very early '70s, and we were still kind of riding off of the '60s, where bands came to see each other. It wasn't competition; it was like, and you encouraged each other. You know, like, oh man, yeah, you're, what a great band! You should be doing this, and everybody encouraged each other you know they would come and see us they liked Mitch Ryder they thought he was great they loved our band and uh, when I went to see them I thought well these guys I, I, I didn't quite get the theater at first but then the more I saw them the more I loved it and there was right. one time I saw them in St. Louis and I just I just got it all in one shot like oh my god this is like the coolest stuff ever you know and uh, I wanted to, I mean, I literally was sitting there in the audience saying, you know what, I'd really like to do that. And the irony of, of that is about a year later, I was on stage in that same arena doing that. Alex. Right, right. That's, uh, no, that's uh, w w one of my first records uh, ever was uh, Alice Cooper's show. So um, yeah. I, I kind of started with, with the greatest hits in the Alice Cooper show. So very early for me was listening to that live album with, with, with yeah with you and, and Dick Wagner and, um, yeah. and just formative stuff. Um, but, but really cool to hear that connection back to the beginning. Um, speaking, of, speaking of that era, and, and uh, there's someone I've always wondered what you thought of this artist, and, and I, I've never seen an interview, because it, Frank Zappa, because he produced the early Alice Cooper and, and helped them along early on. And then you've played with at least two of his drummers, uh, Ainsley Dunbar and Jim Gordon. Um, yeah. what, uh, what's your... Uh, your Zappa, any Zappa stories, the mothers seeing them live, anything? No, you know, the funny thing, I, I never was a big fan of Frank Zappa. So okay. there's, there's a lot of guitar players getting mad at me when I say that. And I understand, I understand. But for some reason or other, although I'll have to say, there's a couple of things that I heard of his later that I thought were really cool. <clears throat> I tended to like his sense of humor in his playing. Yeah. which is something that Jeff Beck is really good. He has a wonderful sense of humor in his playing. And um, so does Frank. And I, and I love that thing he did with his daughter. Valley Girl. Uh, Valley Girl. I thought that was just a wonderful. He did, and some of the other stuff he did, I found later I liked. But at the time when he was out, I really wasn't interested. In right. No, that, that, that's great. And, and, and uh, an honest answer. So many people spin things and, oh, yeah, he's a legend. But no, well, I, I, I love just got more people mad at me. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. well, then they, they need to realize that diversity makes the world go around, right? Yeah, exactly. But, uh, <laughs> you know, well, one, I, one of my favorite records, too, you did a Dave Lee Roth record, which that came out of nowhere because he had that band with. Steve Vine stuff, but I understand that you're obviously a friend of Becker's, but that's another record. Not only do you play 
slide and rhythm, but there's a bunch of co-writes on that. Yeah. How, how did you hook up with Roth? How did that? <laughs> now that's a really funny thing. But man, I tell you, the way I hook up with some of these people, it just doesn't make sense. You would never write that. I couldn't make it up, really. Um, I, one day, I'm in my apartment in Hollywood, and I get a call from Bob Asner. And they say, hey, Bob, how you doing? I thought he was just checking in. I hadn't talked to him in a while. <clears throat> and he called me, and then we started talking. He said, hey, uh, I'm working with David Lee Ross. I think he was doing some pre-production with David. They ended up some sort of falling out, and he didn't produce the record. But he was doing some pre-production with him. And uh, he said, um, I have this great kid, killer kid guitar player named Jason Becker, but he needs some blues and, and he wants to take some lessons and he wants some blues lessons. And how would you like to do that? I'm like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do that. I, I, I needed to work. I wasn't working. So I said, yeah, okay, sure. Send him over. And uh, so he sent, uh, uh, Jason sent me a couple of his CDs, Carcophony. Yeah, <laughs> to it, and I thought, oh man, this guy's not going to talk to me. You know, he's a shredder. He's he's like into a whole other world for me. I don't know what he's going to want, but I said, well, okay, I'll give it a shot. You know, so he comes over. Jason comes over, <clears throat> and he walks in the door, and he's this big, tall, lanky, looks like a guitar player, no doubt. And uh, I thought, you know, I'm going to have one lesson, and he's going to go. <laughs> you know. But we sat down and we started talking. And I, I, I just asked him, I said, well, who who you been listening to lately? Who's sure. like a, a guitar player you really like now? And he said, Stevie Ray Vaughan. And I thought, wow, really? And he said, yeah, man, I just love that guy's blues player. So I said, well, he's, he's terrific, but how would you like to hear where he got what he's doing? And um, so I went and I got this album by Albert King called Years Gone By. And I put the album on and said, now listen to this guy. And he fell in love with it. I ended up giving him the album because he just fell in love with it. Wow. So I thought, well, that's the weirdest thing. I never thought he and I were going to get on. He ended up turning out to be the very best friends. I, I've been in touch with him all this time, all through the ALS. And everything. Right. And uh, he, he really wanted to learn how to play blues. It wasn't just, well, I'll do it because that's what they – he really wanted to learn how to play blues and wanted to learn some of the things that blues players do, the bending and vibrato and all that stuff. And it was a joy. We actually had a lot of fun. Well, <clears throat> David calls me up. David Lee Roth calls me up, you know, and he says, Hey, Steve, how would you like to try writing some songs with Tuggle? And I said, because Brett Tuggle was a good friend of mine. I met him with this writer. And, um, uh, I said, yeah, Dave, sure, I'd love to. So Brett Peckle and I got together and we ended up writing four songs, co-writing four songs. And then David called me up and said, well, how'd you like to come up to Vancouver and play rhythm guitar? Yeah, I'd love to. And that's how that whole thing came about. It was like wow. very bizarre, kind of a back in back door kind of thing. That, yeah, yeah. That, that, another great story. And again, another record yeah. that kind of fell between the cracks a little bit. It was the grunge time and it was kind of, yeah. you know, uh, once those record companies, once they don't put the money behind a record, it, it, it can. So I hope people go back and discover that. Some great riffs. Yeah, on, you know, yeah. I think there's some good stuff on there. I think yeah. I think the, the two songs Jason wrote are brilliant. And, and and there were some really cool grooves, different kinds of groove from Dave's stuff, you know. Yeah. And uh, but there you go. You know, you never know. You, you, no, you don't know. And, and yeah. uh, the blues, of course, runs throughout your, your career and on a lot yeah. of your solo records, a lot of your playing. Um, but yeah. uh, with your own twist to it, like you don't sit there with the same pentatonic licks. I think that's, uh, you know, you, you always took it a, a bit further and, and you still do. The beginning of Train Kept a Rolling, of course, uh, Aerosmith, you yes. know, um, and I know I know that was another fun story where you, you were just in another session or something. Tell, tell us about that. Yeah, it was, uh, Bob, Bob Ezra and I were in uh, the record plant in New York, which I, I got to tell you is my all time favorite studio. Oh, right. It's not there anymore, I don't think. I think oh. it's been changed to uh, the plant or something. something I'm not sure yeah. what it's called anymore. And I think it's, I don't know if that same building is there, but. That was my favorite studio. I, I loved it every time we went there to record. It just sounded great. It's a great room. 
<clears throat> and Bob was in Studio A, which was a great big room. Um, and he had to do some editing, and he wanted me to get out of there and leave him alone because in those days you had to do it with two inch tape, and it's very tedious and very exacting. So I wanted to get out of there and let him let him get to get his business done because as soon as the edit was done, I was going to do some overdubs on whatever the track was. I don't remember what it was. So I was smoking back in those days. So I went out to the lobby. The record plant had this little tiny lobby, and I'm sitting in the lobby and having a cigarette. And right across from me is a, a smaller studio called Studio C. And the door opens up and Jack Douglas pokes his head out and he sees me there and he says, you feel like playing? And I said, well, yeah, I'd rather play in the city here. And he says, well, I'll be right back. So he goes in and asks Bob <coughs> if it's all right if he could borrow me for a, a little while. <laughs> yeah. And Bob said, yeah. And he grabbed an old Tweed Twin, which was my... That was my favorite amp in the world. I wanted that amp so bad I could get it. But Record Plant wouldn't sell it, belonged to them. So he takes it in the studio and says, come on in. And I came in and there was the band. They were standing there. It was a little tiny studio. And uh, he took the amp into the uh, into the room and uh, mic'd it all up, got it all set up. I, I put my guitar and tuned up. And uh, I put the headphones on. And he ran the track for me, and I just kind of noodled around the track. And he, he said, oh, yeah, man, that's, that's going to be great, except you're playing, you're, you're stepping on a vocal. <clears throat> and I said, well, I don't hear the vocal in the headphone. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So he turns up the vocal in the headphones. And then the second time, I thought he was just getting a sound on me, you know. So I just kind of jammed through it, had fun. <laughs> and he said, <laughs> excuse me he said okay that's great and I thought he meant the sound and I said okay great well let's go he said no 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 I mean that's great you're done so the, it was like the second time through he was happy so um, I went back in the studio and I listened to it and I thought well yeah I mean it's okay you know I just I thought I could have done it a little better you know I, I seemed like I I stumbled around a little bit to me but they were really happy with it. So uh, I just shut my mouth and said, well, I'm, I'm glad. You know, it makes me feel bad because so many people love that, that playing. And at, at the time, I, I, didn't, I wasn't sure I had done a very good job. And I sure. kind of felt, <laughs> you know, I kind of felt bad. And then I hear, then it's, it's great because then I hear back from fans who say, oh, no, man, what, what we like about that is that raw energy how you just came at it, you know, and there was no, you didn't take any prison. We love that about that thing. That's so they thought, oh, okay, so now I get it. It's like, now I understand why they, why they liked it so much. Why, it, and it really fits the song so well, you know. Absolutely. So it was a weird thing for me, you know. I did like, whoa, what, what, what happened? <laughs> you know, I went back out and had another cigarette, you know. Right. <clears throat> no, well, one of the, it, it's one of those Zen things in life though as, a, as you're saying we're just being not prepared just uh just going for it and and take no prisoners yes that's what that 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 burst of of, of soloing is like like you the know, beginning of exactly, rock and roll that's exactly what i tried to do I, even though i wasn't being fully aware of it i said i'm just going to go at this thing you know when he said okay let's when he when he hit play when he hit i, I guess play and record i didn't know he was recording I just thought, I'm just going to go at this thing and see what comes out. And uh, then I thought, well, I probably could have done a little better here, a little better done. But then when I hear, when I hear it back now, when I hear it today, I hear that raw energy stuff that they're talking about that, ironically enough, I didn't really hear at the time I did it. Now, that's right. really weird, you know. It's like I, I didn't think I'd done as good as I could have, and everybody said, no, you're out of your mind, you know. And then when I listen to it, I'd say, oh, no, 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 I, I get it now. It's, the, it's that raw energy that just blasts through the track, which is exactly what they needed in there. That's know? right. And so there you go. Sometimes you don't even know your own plan. <laughs> well, that's it. And, and as, as you know very well, um, it's like the demo effect. So many times you do a demo and, and, and it's just, and then there's parts of it you just can't, like, man, you the vocal is so good yeah. on the 
you know, so yeah. I think I could have, I think I could have tried playing that, that solo 20 times and never got it with the same intensity. Right. Because now you're, yep. you're thinking too hard. Um, yeah. Well, well that, that's another producer. And again, it's great to hear that you're your own producer, your own engineer. And, and, and just uh, but being able to be around Jack Douglas there and Bob Ezrin and, and the other Bob, Bob Rock with the, um, yeah. with the, uh, the Roth record. Let's, let's talk then a, a, a bit more about Cafe La Rouge and Cover With Love and um, done in your own studio. What's it been like under pandemic? Have you been writing more or do you, have you well, been you know, chilling out? Care, What's... We, we, sat and, we sat and sort of talked about it. Like, well, okay, we can't go anywhere. And do, we don't do a whole lot anyway. <coughs> We're pretty like homebodies type, uh -huh. uh, even though it's absolutely beautiful here. So we do go out, the beach is like, right outside our window so wow. we do a lot of going out and walk on the promenade and Great. things like that but when we found out that we were going to have to stay in um the first thing came to my mind well let's make some music so and karen's a great singer so i <clears throat> so here we'll, here's what we got to do let's let's pick our favorite or some of our favorite cover tunes and i'll try to do some sort of an arrangement of it We'll do our own versions and just because they're going to be fun to play and sing because they're our favorite. And she was all for it. So I just dove into, she, she played um, a track for me called uh, Harry's House, mm. which is Joni Mitchell tune on uh, Hissing a Summer Lawn. Love it. And in the middle of that song is this other song called Centerpiece. And I thought, that uh, Joni had written it. But then we, it turns out we found out it wasn't written by Joni, it was written by three other people in the 40s. But, so we looked it up and we found it, we found their version of it. So I took their version of it in the studio and I just started messing around with chords and messing around with tempo and stuff like that. <laughs> and then I thought, you know what, it'd be really great to have Tony Love to play bass on. There's nobody else who played bass on it. But, so let me call him, let me, email him and ask him if he'd be into doing it. Well, he's having to send it home too. <laughs> so <clears throat> luckily enough, he was into doing it. And uh, we got his bass part back and it was so good, man. He just, his bass just made all of these tracks just light up and glue together. It was fabulous. So um, that's how we got started. We started on Centerpiece and then we just, hey, this was fun, let's do some more. And, and that's how the EP came about. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, and, and, and yes, you said it when Tony Levin plugs that bass in, forget about it, you know, and, yeah. and, and yeah. few people on this earth know that more than you. I mean, again, going back to records with him 45 oh, okay. years ago, um, what, what a team. A joy playing with him, I'm telling you, as, as a musician to play with him on stage or play with him in the studio, it's just an absolute joy. That's yeah, I, I, it's, um, I've had the fortune to, to tour with him a few times. And yeah, as you know, what a funny guy. He's hilarious. Oh, and he's, <laughs> yeah. people, you know, he, people. The, the poo base. Let me tell you where the poo yeah, base is. Yeah, please, please. So when I was doing Centerpiece, I would put a bass part on, on the track to send Tony just so that he knows where the roots are of the chord. Because, you know, uh, you can play a minor seven, but it's actually a major six, you know, right. not, so by just changing the bass. So I wanted to make sure he knew where, what route I wanted. So I didn't really do anything with the bass. Yeah, yeah. Just... Kind of stupid. <clears throat> so I named it Poo Bass on the track. And he thought that was bloody hilarious. So he, he said, oh, I got to use that. And I said, okay, it's yours. You can use it all. You can let, <laughs> So every one of the tracks I sent it, my bass is called Pooh Bass. That's great. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Well, he, yeah, he, he said, make sure, <laughs> make sure you bring that up. And there's that humor right yeah. away, you know. Um, <laughs> so, so, so that's great. So y'all st re started recording this when? March, April? When? It was March, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Right about, yeah, right at the beginning wow. of the lockdown. We got locked down a little bit earlier than some of the other places because Spain, uh, Madrid, uh, Madrid's uh, just exploded, uh, so they locked it down really quickly, really tightly. 
Yeah. So we we were in the first week of March. I think we were locked down. I, so yeah, yeah, we started thinking about it then. Yeah, that that's um, so, so in, in a matter of three months, you know, from beginning to end, and, and and what a paradigm for the modern music industry, where I mean, you've you've done it all, and you've seen the, the record industry stuff, and the lawyers, and the bad deals, and all the, the things around you, and here it is, you can sit in your home, do a, an incredible sounding record, and it's it's out, and it's it's in the world. Uh, talk to talk to me a little bit about your thoughts on that because you've seen now several generations of this music industry. How do you feel about it now that you are, you can do it well, at home? You know, boy, if that's a you could fill a book with that. I'm yes, tell you. you're right. I have seen a lot of ugly shit and I've seen a lot of good stuff. Yeah, I've seen an awful lot of weird stuff in the business and. Um, <clears throat> the, the, a part of me, you know, Bob Ezrin has a great quote now uh, that really kind of a, uh, sums it all up. Um, he says, the great news is with today's technology, anyone can make a record. And the bad news is with today's technology, anybody can make a record. <laughs> yeah. So that's... It's, like, it's a double edged sword, you know. I always wanted to be able to roll in a two inch tape and <clears throat> have a, a hundred input console and all that stuff. I knew probably I wasn't going to be able to afford that. It's just too expensive. And then when digital recording came along, I thought, oh, okay, well, there's hope. I'll be able to, maybe I'll be able to put together a studio and do stuff at home because I really love, I love the recording process. I, <coughs> I spent a lot of time in studios in the 70s trying to learn as much about it as I could. I was just fascinated by it. <clears throat> and I had some really good teachers. Jack Douglas was a great help to me and Shelly Yakas. And there were a lot of these engineers that were, and second engineers, I think there's one thing, Jim Frank in Toronto, who, was, who never shied away from answering a, a dumb question I may have had about, well, hey, Jim, what's that? What's it do? <clears throat> he was very helpful. I learned so much from him. Sure. Uh, yeah. I was fascinated by it and I wanted to learn how to do it, if nothing else, just to know from my own knowledge. But then, then I got to the point where, you know, like I'd like to have a little eight track. And I bought an eight track and had a little bit of tiny console. It just didn't sound very good, but I was learning. I was learning stuff all the time. And then when the digital stuff came along, the only problem it, I, I see with it is that the people who are recording through a computer, generally speaking, haven't had the knowledge of what it's like to record analog. Some, and yeah. there are certain things you learn when you record analog that can easily be applied to digital recording. And it makes digital recording sound better. There's a lot of people recording drums that have not a clue how to mic a drum. And that worries me because <clears throat> there are so many things that just don't sound as good as they could simply because they rushed into it. So, okay, well, I won't use drums. I won't mic drums. I'll use drum loops or I'll use drum, drum applications or stuff. So there, it's a two-edged sword, man. I, I can make some great drum sounds in my studio now with the plugins I have. Uh, they've gotten so sophisticated now. It's right. like there's a kit, you know? Yeah. That's so it's like a two-edged sword. Through all of this, it's a joy for me to go in there and turn my stuff on. But half the plugins I got are analog modeling plugins. I try to get in as much analog stuff as I can. And when I record with Pro Tools, which is what I use, <clears throat> I tend to try to, te to uh, treat it as if it were a tape recorder rather than a digital format. So I think in terms that the Pro Tools is a 24-track yeah. So I got a, I got a over, I got a punch, you know, yeah. rather than edit. So it's, it's a different headspace for me, but you know, it's scary when you don't have to know one note of music to make an entire album of music. You don't. It, it's, it's yeah. That's a little scary to me, and it's gonna, it's gonna affect. To me, it's gonna affect the soul of a piece of music. 
Yes. That I'm not sure in a good way. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, one of the things uh, we, we this is a great segue because I always want to see what artists are listening to today. And you're exactly right. I see these little ads on YouTube of these apps. You just drag a chord and it's in the right key, and it, or it'll change the key. And you have zero knowledge of of the concepts of of you know major minor. What's it? Yeah, what's I mean they brag chord? about it. They brag about it. Right. Like, well, you. <laughs> I don't know anything about music. Yeah. And here's, that's really scary. Yeah, just even the simplest chordal knowledge or triadic construction. Yeah. On that note, I, I want to ask you about a band that I'm really excited about, and and not, because th there's the band, and then they all do solo stuff. Have you heard of a group, uh, Snarky Puppy? No, have you? No, I haven't heard of them. Yeah, well, th th that's pretty cool. It, check them out when you get a chance uh, i think I you'd like them because uh, they're a real bright light in 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 this because it's pretty much all trained musicians everyone's reading and there's a brilliant guy named michael league who 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 leads this group and he just did uh, three wonderful records with david crosby so he's actually oh. he's <laughs> in his 30s i think and, and and working with someone like crosby on beautiful acoustic stuff but but snarky puppy is kind of this uh, fusion jazz band uh, you know jazz rock whatever you want to say but a little bit yeah. of chick korea weather report that kind of thing oh. with horn, horn sections you know great guitar uh, every record's different uh, some have horns some don't but what i love about it is um it's these big groups it's usually 10 12 15 people and they split off and so you're seeing and they're hugely popular and and what i really love about it even if you don't love all the music what i love is that there's a whole generation of fans who are going, I have to learn an instrument. I have yeah. to, I, let me, you know, so, so there's some hope. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's, there's some other groups. Uh, there's this guy, Thundercat, who's yeah. huge. And uh, have you heard him? I've, no, I've heard that name. I think we've heard that name. Did we see it on YouTube or something? Yeah, I think okay. we may. So those are two people where I say, you know, um, to your point, to your very good point, like, oh man, it's all just buttons now. But but there's there's this these oh, there's other artists too. But there are some some people saying, no, 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 no. Instruments, learn your craft, learn your yeah. theory. So um, but but that's a you, you're um, this is great to get some insight on your production sense because again, uh, uh, covered with love, uh, I, I can't say enough about how good it sounds. It's amazing that it's it's a home recording i mean people are going to be stunned to hear that and and it really there's a you know, thread hey that makes me feel really good you know because no I, I, I really really hard trying to make that thing sound good i wanted to i wanted when it came out i wanted it to sound like it belonged on a radio and not you know not as an mp3 in somebody's I, that's phone, it you know? that's it and i wouldn't blow smoke steve i mean i'm, I'm really a stickler for i hate how many things come out now just you can hear how how badly they're done and Digital yeah, distortion yeah. and badly mastered. <laughs> On that note, I'm hearing now a straight thread back to Swept Away, the 77 year solo record, where that's another one where you put that on and it doesn't sound, it's timeless. Like this new record yeah. is, it, you can't listen to it and go, yeah, it sounds kind of this year. It's just yeah, very yeah. well recorded. Talk to me about that, how you did that, because that was in the middle of all those records, Lace and Whiskey and all the Cooper stuff. And then you yeah. found time with those guys to do a record. Take us there. That was really cool, actually, that that time, because it was like I was doing a lot of things back to back, which I tend to like. It really keeps you sharp. And uh, I was doing Peter Gabriel's album. I was doing an Alice, a couple of Alice albums. I was doing my own album. It was really cool. It was like really back to back, and I loved it. Um, I, I, I know I, I knew I wanted Bob to produce it. Um, it wasn't a big budget, you know, so we had to cut some corners. But I knew if Bob were there, that it would, we would get nice music on the tape, and that's that's what mattered to me. And I had to write the stuff, and I already knew I wanted Jimmy Gordon on drums. He's just he's a fabulous, fabulous drummer. And uh, his feels are were to die for, you know. And um, Prakash uh, played bass on it uh, because I figured that on on some of the stuff I thought Prakash would be just the right guy to do it, you know, because he has certain funk style and things like that. And some of the tracks I had were kind of funky. Yeah. And, 
he fit right in. I mean, he was, and he worked well with Jimmy Gordon. So yeah, um, that was just, that was just fun. I, I, I think I needed to learn. I was still learning how to write stuff. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not one of those writers that can just like sit down and write a tune. Okay. You know, I, I, it takes sometimes it takes me a while, and some of the songs did take a while. Some of them it just come from nowhere, but it, it does take me a while. And Bob was really a big help in in arra- help with, with arrangements and stuff like that. I had a lot of fun doing it. It was like my first solo album, so it meant a lot to me. Yeah. So it was important to us that we got it down the way we I wanted, you know. And uh, Bob was great. He was perfect for that. The guys played great and things. I'm very happy and proud of that record. It's okay. as, as you should be, man. It, it's it's a, it's killer. And one of the things I remember is is in the college dorm years, you're listening to records with friends. That cover just jumps out at you. It's a, oh yeah, yeah. What that a weird a, cover. And, yeah. and yeah, so it, it, it's a great one. Um, and then um, you just uh, I, I hope again that, that people um, that don't know about it go back and look for that. Uh, that C Sonata. I really love that one. That's got that's got a little Alice Cooper energy around it to me anyway yeah, that... oh absolutely i mean it was a big influence all that stuff's a big influence on me so yeah uh, and then you can hear some of my hawaiian and right the deal you know there's all there, i just tried to get a bunch the, the thing i i didn't want to do is i didn't want to as sometimes i think this has hurt my career right okay i didn't want to focus it all on one type of music i i like the broadness of bringing in like an acoustic thing here and then a rock thing here and then kind of a funk thing. I I don't know if that was a good for me to do because I really think probably in the long run as far as popularity and as far as success, it's probably better to find one thing and really focus on it and get really good at it. And I tended to like the, the reason I like doing sessions is I got to do all kinds of different music. It was great going from Peter Gabriel to Alice Cooper to Lou Reed. That was wonderful. Fantastic. Me. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm the wrong guy to, to, cause I agree with you on that. I, I love that you, you've jumped all around and, and, and today learning that you, the guitar synth and all that technology is, yeah. is with you. Um, I'm just going to, let's see if I have some audio here just to, uh, because of copyrights, you can't play some stuff on, in these interviews, but I think I can, yeah. The rule is seven seconds, and that's all I need with this. I'm just going to play this. Oh, yeah, I remember that. That's it. <laughs> so it, I'm, I'm under the legal line there. But, <laughs> yeah. but one, one of the things I want to say, just like the beginning of that Lou Reed record, when you put that on, everyone, oh, yeah, this, this rock and roll animal, crank it up, or the beginning of – the Aerosmith record or the beginning of, of so many of those riffs on goes to hell and uh, yeah. welcome to my nightmare. Uh, that right there is just one of the most epic openings that, ever, you know, and, and uh, talk to us a little bit about how you came up with that and, 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 you know, working on that Gabriel record. That's a, that's actually a very interesting story because uh, when we did that record, uh, we, we did it actually as if it were a live band. We, did, we had eight musicians on the basic track. So it was basically a live recording album, the whole album. Of course, we overdubbed stuff and, you know, things like that. But we overdubbed an orchestra. But the basic track had eight musicians on it. So that's a huge band to be doing the basic track. And, uh, of course, there are a lot of variables in that, stuff like that. But these musicians were so bloody good. You had, you had Tony Levin and Alan Schwartzberg and Robert Tripp and all that stuff. Larry Fast. There were so many great players on that thing. So we're working on the album, and I, I keep hearing from Bob and Peter, they keep talking about this other song called Salisbury Hill. And uh, I kept wondering, well, when are we going to do that one? We, you know, we, we just kept doing song after song after song. We never got to Salisbury Hill. And um, then it came time for some of the New York guys had to leave. Um, I think uh, Schwartzberg, Tony Levin, Jimmy Malin, and I think Larry, no, Larry Fast. Yeah, I think Larry Fast had to leave. They had sessions in, booked in New York, so they had to leave Toronto the next day. So I find out later that Bob and Peter 
were having trouble with one of the lines in Salisbury Hill. One of the lyric lines just wasn't cutting it. Neither one of them liked it, Peter or Bob. And they were, Peter was trying all these different things. And he finally came up with the line that finished it off. Time to grab your things and let, let us take you home. Or let me take you home. That last line. That was the one he was having trouble with. And he finally came up with it. So the day before everybody left, we decided that let's we got to get in here and record this. Now Robert Fripp had already gone because he had sessions in London then. So he had already left. So it was um, it turned out to be kind of a skeleton crew of the band. It was me and Larry Fast and Schwartzberg, Jimmy Malin. Right. Um, I think there was uh, Peter Gabriel, I think actually played a keyboard part too. Yeah, he, and, and Larry, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And yeah, Larry as you said, so, as you said. I, I remember the night that we started, we got ready to work on it. Bob called me, and Bob and Peter, had, uh, Bob had an office in uh, Toronto in the studio, and he brought us into the studio, or into the office, and there was a piano there, and Peter played the song. And I was sitting there, and Bob said, listen, what I'd like to do is I'd like to do this piano part as a guitar part like Travis picking. And I said, okay, but before I got okay all the way out my mouth, I realized this thing is in seven. And I hadn't played anything in seven four, any, nothing. So I, I just immediately panicked. Oh my God, I, how am I going to play seven? I'm going to have to sit there and count the thing all the way through. <clears throat> so I go get my, uh, I go get a guitar. I didn't have a, an acoustic guitar. We borrowed uh, that guy, Jim Frank, I told you about. Oh, yeah. He had a beautiful Martin in the shop, uh, in his shop, and he let me borrow that, put on capo on the second fret, because the song's in B, and we started working on it, and uh, Bob kind of showed me what he had in mind, you know, and then Peter played the piano part again, and just through experimentation and booming around, we got, we worked out the part. And uh, went in the studio, and I recorded it three times. We recorded three passes. One, uh, one was down the middle, which was in tune. One on the left, I think, was tuned down a little bit, and one on the right was tuned up a little bit. Oh. <coughs> those, those were the days. That's how you got a chorus. A chorus, yeah. Yeah. So you tune them a little out of tune, and that, and then it gets this wonderful swimming sound. You know. Wow. That's how we did that. That's how we did that. And we recorded it that night, and it just was a magnificent song. I, I didn't really realize how good it was because I, I was busy counting. <laughs> right. One, two, three, one, two. You know, I was, yeah. I, was I had done that stuff before. So you were in it. But, and yeah, I was in it. That's right. And then you covered it years later. On, yeah, on I had record, to. Right? yeah. Yeah. I had you. to. And I had to get Tony to play bass on it because he played bass exactly. on it. Exactly. No, that's it. Yeah, it was that was that was really a lot of fun to do my own version of it. That was really a lot of fun. Right. No, that's a wonderful cover, and um, uh, it, well, what a great story! And and just again, you know, like you couldn't have planned that, right? Just no. if if no. that guitar wasn't there, or if it was a shittier guitar, or if yeah. it was, uh, true, yeah. any any number of 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 things, you know, that would have um, it just ended up very different. That's yeah. fantastic. Um, the, the, the Alice Cooper story, we could do three hours on just those records, like one by one, you know, goes to hell and, and every wonderful records, yeah. man. Yeah. You know, um, uh, which we don't have time for, obviously, but uh, maybe we'll do another one that's just the Cooper years or something because they go so long. And you know, my, you know my number now. Yeah, yeah. What, what, I, um, what I wanted to say though is is again uh and you've even taken it further back than i knew that again i'm just blown away picturing you playing the mitch Ryder show yeah. and, and those guys are there um so let's look at both ends of that um what was it like going back in, into the cooper uh recording world for paranormal and for stuff just a few years ago that was that a nice reunion that were, who was there well you know it was wonderful because in 2011 i toured with him again right I did a world tour with him, and and that was pretty much because I uh, I they had, they were in Nashville playing it uh, doing a tour, 
And uh, Shep, uh, Alice's manager, right. asked me uh, if I wanted to sit in that night. And I said, oh, man, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to do that. Hello. <laughs> so I went, to, <laughs> I went down to the, the arena. I don't know where it was exactly. It was in Nashville, so I don't know which one it was. But we went down, I went down there with the guitar. And uh, I, sit on, I sat in on uh, I'm 18. Wow. And, uh, of course, I'd only played that a bajillion times yeah. before. And Forever. Oh, God, it was like I had never left. It was like the most bizarre feeling. It was like the, the weirdest Twilight Zone episode ever. You know, like I looked over and there's Alice singing 18. And I remember last time I did that was 1979. And, uh, you know, it was like the most, but it was absolutely wonderful. And they, uh, uh, Shep asked me if I'd like to do the 2011 tour. And I said, yep, let's do it. And so I toured with them. And then after that, um, when they start talking about doing another record, they did. Um, uh, did they do? They did. Welcome to my nightmare. Yes, before yes that. that's the first time you came out. Yeah, that was. And I, I had gone in to do some overdubs on that. And yeah, uh, we, that's exactly why we were in Nashville. Sorry, I left that part out. Yeah, yeah. But uh, that's why we we're in Nashville, and I, and I did some overdubs on that, and it, oh my God, that was amazing because I had really played with Alice since 79 uh, until I got that call from Bob. Yeah. So <laughs> so here I am on the album. Now I'm doing a tour. And then I come off the tour and there's some time goes by and I put out Manhattan Blues and I, I put out some other stuff and I do I do some other and I moved around a bit. You know, we moved from Nashville back to Phoenix and body block. <clears throat> the next thing I know I get another call from Bob and hey we, uh, we how about playing on this track and that track on Paranormal? So it's like we sort of never, we lost touch a bit in the 80s. I'm not sure exactly why. Uh, Alice had gone into another realm of music anyway, which was kind of different for me. And I had got, I was doing like film scoring, but it was kind of low budget film scoring stuff. And uh, I was doing different stuff. He was doing different stuff. So we kind of lost, lost touch. But I kind of always kept my eye out, you know, like I think I saw him at the House of Blues in Los Angeles one time. So, so we, we kept loose contact over sure. all the years. And here, here recently, we've been in more contact than almost all the other time. That's so great. It's been cool. Yeah, it's been cool. Yeah, and he's got that great song about the pandemic. I forget, Don't Give Up or something like that. What, what, yeah. Great. Yeah. What a great song and, and different for him with the spoken word and kind of you know we can fight this virus you know it's it's pretty cool like alice cooper yeah it's very it's a very cool it's still, still alice cooper yeah charging us up and um you know uh he he took this moment and turned it into one of his things but again you're, you're integral to that man because um you know and that's another one where you have I, i'm a huge fan of course the original band and all that and there's a lot yeah. of people who split off oh it's not the original guys i don't know man Th that era that you did is still some of my favorite And, and and working with Dick, you know, you guys, yeah. the the what a friendship, what a and, and rest in peace. I know what a dear friend to have lost, you know, um, you and him. Yeah, Dick. we were we were definitely a team, you know. It, it, one of those things where um, you 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 couldn't you couldn't have really put us together any other way than the way it happened, which was just. Oh yeah, hi Steve. This is Dick Wagner. Dick, this is Steve. You guys are going to be the two guitar players on the Lou Reed team. That was it. We yeah. did, we'd never played together before, wow. ever, and here we are. We're learning Lou Reed tunes and going to go over to Europe. And but there was something that gelled from the very first day. So we already kind of knew it was. Uh, oh, this is going to be great. You yeah. Know, it, it was one of those things where he would do one thing and I would do the opposite. I would do one thing, he would do the opposite, and it always gelled. Yeah. So. You know, yeah, it was a special thing. You know, so thankful that both of you, um, in a time where it was all about gunslinging and egos and all this, and you yeah. guys got together and said, "Hey, let's work together for the song." I mean, that is so rare in rock and roll. And then, and you know, we, we actually that. Sat before we went to Europe and we went through the set list, and we made sure that we each had an equal number of solos because 
We didn't want it being lead in one way or the other. It was very important to us. So we sat down and went through every song and say, okay, Dick, you play this one and I'll play this one and then you play the end. And then on this one, I'll start the end. We worked it all out as to who played solos where so that it was even. Because uh, that was important to us. We didn't want to, we didn't want one guy overshadowing the other. Right, right. But what's great is you guys did it with, with fun and it's like watching a great duel between friends. Uh, yeah. So many moments that, um, of course, everyone, that the beginning of the rock and roll animal thing, but also on, uh, in, in, the, in the Cooper nightmare film, there's that duel as you guys do. That's one. And at the yeah. beginning of, um, or it goes to hell as that song is fading out. Oh, man. You guys are going, and there, there's there's a riff I always wondered on there. This goes really nerdy, but um, there's a riff, <laughs> and I never know who's doing it. It's um, the da 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 well, it's a cool blues. It falls really well. I Sorry. I can't remember where I heard it, but I thought I stole it from somebody. I felt it, kind of bad about it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, now I know it. That, that's the Steve. I'm surprised Steve. somebody rid me. Hey, man, that was my thing. You stole that from me. <laughs> well, it's but a yeah, nice. It, it was a lick I had heard or something. Yeah. I put it in there kind of tongue in cheek. I thought it would be kind of cool for you. Right, and and it pops up later in the record, and and but um, no, that, that's that's fantastic. So so what's what's some plans for right now for for the hunters? Do you, do you think he'll? I mean, because this this thing's gonna go on. It looks like right. I mean, at least for some time you're gonna. No, I, the wonderful thing about being a guitar player is you don't have to retire unless your hands don't work anymore or something. No, and um, I do have a little arthritis in my left hand. I got to be careful with that. It hurts sometimes. There's some creams you can put on there. So, sure. so we're, I'm going to work until I can't work anymore. Great. <laughs> right now, I'm working on an instrumental version. Should I tell him the, the yeah. title? I got up one morning, and right before I woke up, like in that weird zone you're in, right before you wake up. I had this idea, you know, I should do an instrumental version of I Shot the Sheriff. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I don't know where that came from. I never I wasn't thinking about it. I was thinking about doing reggae, too, because I love reggae. Yeah, I see reggae, the hat there, yeah. Awesome rhythms and stuff, you know. <clears throat> so I was going to do a, I was going to do a reggae tune, but I, I couldn't, I was just going to write one or something. But I had this idea, I and I'm, right now I'm working on the instrumental version of I Shot the Sheriff. Wow. <laughs> but what I'm going to do, what I'm thinking about doing, this is Terran's idea. I did an album a few years ago called Hymns for Guitar. Right. It's all acoustic uh, guitar stuff of, of hymns, old, old American hymns. I might do a second version of that. I might do volume two of that, but I'm going to do it with electric guitars instead of acoustic guitars. And I'm going to try to make it a little more... Uh, Oh, I don't know how to put it, more maybe atmospheric or spacey. Because, boy, some of those old hymns had amazing melodies. And uh, that's my that's been my love since I got into playing music with melody. Yeah. So, yeah, so I may I may do that, although I'm not sure. It just may go either way. I may, just, I may decide to just write some more instrumental stuff. You know, I don't know. But I'm going to keep working. I'm going to keep playing. We love it. No, we hope you do, because... Um... You know, uh, people need music, and 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 the fact that you've got a a a setup and a, a way to just get it out to the world is is wonderful. So we hope you do it, and I personally hope you do some stuff uh, with the the people haven't heard enough of. I think with the guitar synth and kind of the stranger <laughs> kind of textures and sounds. You know what? Things. That's that's why I'm saying I'm going to keep it open because. I want to set the guitar. Right now, the guitar synth needs to be reset because uh, I have a different guitar pick. I have the G3 pickup. G3, oh, yeah. And um, I have to reset it. I put it on my uh, Jeff Beck Strat, and it has to be set up. So as soon as I set that up, I'm going to start playing around with it again. Okay. Because I really, really love the sound of it. I also like to be able to control other synths with it. 
So I'm just going to start playing around with it and see what comes out. You know? That's great. That's great. Yeah. Have you ever used the, I, I agree, I, one of my favorite things they've come out with, I mean, that sometimes Roland, they just come out with stuff and they always miss one part of it. That was really a hit. Um, yeah. Have you ever used the, uh, the, the Roland Ready Strats, the ones made for that? Yeah, they were actually pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, I think I borrowed one one time. I just never, I just never owned one, but I yeah. borrowed one. It was pretty good. Yeah. I have a, <coughs> excuse me, I have a golden. Uh, oh, yeah. Nylon string that's uh, rolled ready. Thirteen pin, yeah. That's... It does really well. Yeah, it has thirteen pin. It has a built-in uh, GK3 pickup. Right. And it does really well. It sounds great. Go Godin has done a great job on that. I I, I too I have the multi-ac one and. Um... Oh yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. Great, you know they they yeah. so that's no well I, that's a, an area that uh, I hope you, you keep going down that road. Have you used the um, there's an editor that you can pull up your your whole patches on the on the computer? Have you used that ever for the? No, I haven't downloaded that yet. I saw it, but I haven't downloaded. That yeah, well, what's, down do that. Yeah. what's cool about it, especially as you know the 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 device so well? What's really cool is you see everything at once, the oh. patch, the effects, and you can really. You know, um, instead of going through the menus, it's all there. And, is that is that a, is that by Roland or is that by third party? I think it's third party. I'll follow up on an email. I'll send you a link. Is, but is I, that I the think one it, from the floorboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fifty-five floorboard. I, I did. I saw that. I just haven't downloaded it yet. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's a good idea. I'll do that. I will have to check it out. Yeah, okay. that's great. Well, Steve, you know, uh, you know, it's this has been just fantastic um I, all i hope what all karen and i ever hoped about this ep is that when people listen to it they get a little bit of joy and a little bit of peace and maybe put a little smile on their face it's just supposed to be gentle sweet music you know that's all it's supposed to be and we and that's why that's how we want people to accept it you know just that way that's yeah. <laughs> uh, how, how is it in Spain? I mean, are people being very careful? Is there kind of a... You know, God bless them, they really are. Okay. I, I have to say, you know, uh, and they're and they're very strict out of here on the promenade because it's out on the beach. Of course, everybody wants to just go hang out on the beach and everyone have to wear masks and stuff. But I tell you what, when you look out there, <clears throat> it's a huge percentage of people wearing masks out there. The, the people who aren't usually are foreigners. Right. Not, in, not from Spain. Right. But the, the people here are very conscientious about that, and, sure. and they're very good about it. They're, they, you know, they've lost people. They think this is the way it's going to do it. This is what the people are telling us to do to, to get rid of this thing. This is what we're going to do. They're really very cooperative. They do have, uh, for the first couple of days, they had police patrols up and down the promenade, just letting everybody know that, you know, we're going to reinforce this. But... We haven't seen them much lately. They're, they're not out there anymore because people are doing it. People, yeah, people have respect. Yeah, yeah. That's great. That's great. Well, that, that's great, man. That, that's ha I'm happy to hear that you, you feel safe and, and we're just going to yeah. wait this out, fight it, and, you know, uh, more music. But in the meanwhile, keep making music. Keep doing I this. And, do. and, yep. and, and keep enjoying the downtime and the sunshine and the good olive oil and the fish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, it's 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 Spain after all. Um, a pleasure, Steve. We'll do this again, and um, you know, you, you obviously love to tell stories and, and great old. No, I do, I do. Yeah. I've told a lot of them over and over and over again. But you know, the thing is, I have to remember that I grew up as a little country boy in this little tiny town called Decatur, Illinois, and here I am sitting in Spain talking to a guy from New Jersey who's heard all my records and seen me on, knows about my touring and knows about my career, that's an amazing move, you know? So I have to respect that and I have to have, it humbles me to think about it, but I have to have respect for that and I have to enjoy telling those stories, you know, because it's my life. And there are all these people now that know about that. It's amazing to me. I never would have thought that when I was growing up. Ever. Right, yeah. Well, hopefully there's a few new ones today and, and, and a lot of people are going to hear them for the first time. So um, yeah. Let's, yeah. <laughs> thanks again. Uh, thank you, Karen. Oh, you're welcome. 
and we'll um thanks and we'll see you both uh sometime soon sometime Great. soon thank Take you care. buddy thank you all the best Bye -bye.